Okay, so first of all, it's great to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. This is a really uh, fantastic conference. It looks like there's such a great kind of lineup of, um, of talks on different subjects. Uh, and although I was initially thought, oh no, I'm first. Uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm actually kind of grateful to be first because some of the things I think that I'm going to try and do is set up the discussion that from looking at the titles of various people's papers that I think that we're going to go on and have. Um, so some of the stuff, particularly what I'm going to say at the beginning, will be familiar to some people here, um, maybe everyone here, maybe all of it's familiar to everyone here. So one of our registered this morning thought, maybe everybody already knows this. Um, but anyway, so we'll see what you think about that. Um, as you can see, the title of the talk is not the title that I initially submitted. And the reason for that is that uh, once I started trying to write, uh, the, the headline title is the same, but the second bit's changed. Once I started trying to write, what should we, what should we preserve, or whatever the original question was, I thought, hmm, but actually that's going too far on, and I need to take some steps back and think about, you know, what actually is at stake here, not just, you know, trying to make the evaluation about it. Given what's at stake, what should we preserve? I don't want to go that far. I want to sort of stop earlier. Uh, so I'm going to talk about something which is obviously directly relevant uh, for this conference. Um, thinking about the animal, the alleged animal liberation environment ethics divide, uh, and then um, uh, in particular in the context of climate change. So we were asked to talk about this, right? So the conference is about convergence of and divergence between animal ethics and environmental ethics. Uh, and it's specifically how far there is overlap between policies that would be required for the sake of animals alone, including humans, versus those required for the sake of organisms, including animals, entire species, and ecosystems. So I took that remit very seriously, uh, and that's really kind of what this paper is about, right? What we should think about, have this kind of overlap, how far there's overlap. So what I'm going to do is say something briefly about the historic rift between environmental and animal ethics. And then I'm going to talk about what's probably a well-known kind of complication of that rift uh, with respect to different approaches to animal ethics, a kind of divide between sentientist consequentialists on the one side and animal rights theorists on the other. Uh, and then I'm going to say, well, that's, that is a complication, but actually when we start thinking about climate change, it turns out that there are much more, com more complications but there are not only these kinds of divides between animal ethicists, there are divides between environmental ethicists, and um, there are also potentially convergences between some unexpected positions uh, between animal ethicists and environmental ethicists where you wouldn't necessarily expect to find them. And all of this, uh, one of the nice things about writing this paper was that I had an opportunity to go back and look at uh, lots of the work from the 1980s and 1990s about animal liberation and environmental ethics, which I haven't reread for years. I had the pleasure of rereading some of Baird's great papers from the past that he likes to hide and not republish. So it was fantastic to have the opportunity to do that. Uh, and I reread Dale Jameson's 1998 paper, Animal Liberation is an Environmental Ethic, um, which I'm sure some of you are familiar. And he makes this claim early on in his paper that divisions among animal liberationists and among environmental ethicists can be as deep and profound as the differences between those groups. And I'm not sure that I'm exactly saying that, but I think that he was really onto something there. And then he didn't really develop it. So the paper talks about that in like the last page and a half, but he doesn't really talk about those differences. So that's really kind of what I'm going to, going to talk about, and then talk about how this presents some interesting challenges, uh, especially in the context of climate change for animal and environmental ethics. So that's the plan. Okay. So in terms of thinking about the traditional rift, so this is the bit that's probably old hat for everyone here, right? Um, there's the, the idea that animal ethicists are essentially centered around uh, the idea of animals as being sentient, so as being conscious, uh, having subjective experience and so on, and that that gives them uh, moral considerability and some level of, some that varies between accounts, but uh, relatively high uh, moral significance as well. So ranging from equality, maybe something a little less than that, depending on what view you take. Uh, but the basic idea is that animals matter for their own sake, and they matter a lot for their own sake. Uh, so that's using for, I'll use for their own sake a number of times here, 
partly because that means I don't have to give kind of lots of complicated different justifications. You know, they just matter in themselves, and they matter a lot. Um, and then environmental ethicists, so in this debate, the animal ethics, uh, animal ethics, environmental ethics debate, uh, on the other side from animal ethics is environmental ethics generally understood as basically some kinds of holistic views. So biocentrism never really got much of a foothold in this debate. So there are some papers on that uh, coming up in the conference, or at least on you know, the value of individual plants and things like that. This debate, though, as I understand it, was really about the difference between individualist in animal ethics and holist in environmental ethics, and not so much about individualists in terms of all living organisms. So that would be another place to kind of trouble the animal ethics, environmental ethics distinction. Um, but anyway, I'm just going to assume that I'm talking about primarily holistic views. I'm not going to try and justify these views here. Uh, I'm, and I know there are lots of different accounts of, on which they're based. So I'm just going to assume that there is a for the sake of ecosystem for species and work with that as a, as, a, as a basis. The other thing I also have meant to include is the idea that built into this view, at least many versions of this view, is a thought that we should protect wildness in some way. Um, and certainly in some of the early accounts, I mean, in Mark Sagoff's uh, paper, uh, the, the 1984 the famous paper, he talks about wildness as well. So I'm going to bundle wildness in with thinking about species and ecosystems. Okay, so the classic statement, uh, this statement from Mark Sagoff in 1984, I won't read it to you, uh, but essentially his argument is, you know, that there is this big rift, animal liberationists can't be environmentalists, by which he means ecocentrists of some kind, um, because these views are in conflict with one another. Uh, and so they should never have come together and there should have. I still think that's one of the best titles of, a, of an environmental ethics paper. I still love that paper style. Okay, so that's the basic the idea of the rift. So in terms of complicating this risk, um, this risk, this rift, um, one of the, um, the kind of early-ish sorts of attacks uh, came from my colleague Gary Varner uh, at Texas A&M University, who argued that the idea that there was a kind of animal liberation on one side and environmental ethics on the other side missed out the fact that there were divergent views amongst animal ethicists. <coughs> And that that was something that would make a difference in policy terms. Uh, and in particular, he argues that there's a distinction between what he calls, and I'm going to use his language even though it's ghastly to pronounce, sentientist consequentialists on the one side, by which he means people that are essentially concerned with improving aggregate animal welfare. So that would include utilitarians, most utilitarians, like Peter Singer, for instance. Uh, on the one side, and animal rights theorists like Tom Regan would be on the other side. And that if we think about that division, that's going to come up with uh, really a different sort of set of policies than you would expect if there was a rift between animal people on one side and environment people on the other. And the case that he talks about when he makes this point is therapeutic hunting. Uh, so I just want to say something about that because I think this is an interesting case. This is supposed to be a picture of a, a starving white-tailed deer, just in case you don't know just it's actually got its ribs showing. Um, I couldn't find out, I was like, well, there must be good pictures of starving deer somewhere on the internet, but you know, people obviously don't think that's a very photographically beautiful image, so hard to find them. Anyway, so his basic argument was um, that if you're doing hunting for the purposes of uh, wealth, uh, the, either the aggregate welfare of a deer population, deer is, is, is a classic kind of case, or if you're hunting in order to promote ecosystem flourishing, uh, then you could get support from that from some sentient consequentialists. So where you have species like deer that regularly overshoot their, 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 um, their range, their population gets so big, they eat everything out, they cause harm to the ecosystem, uh, and then they, get, they become starving, they suffer a lot, there's big die-off, the population drops right down, uh, the ecosystem begins to recover, the population starts growing again. If you have species that are like that, which he calls obligatory management species, then uh, hunting is actually something that if you are assenting to consequentialist, you're going to support because it's actually better for animal welfare to kill the right deer relatively painlessly uh, than to allow a large number of deer to starve to death. 
Uh, you're reducing suffering in the world, you're improving aggregate animal welfare. And so he argues in cases like that, the sentientist consequentialists are basically going to converge with the eco-holists. And the animal rights theorists are going to be in a different place. So there you don't have a clean divide between animal ethicists and environmental ethicists. You have basically some consequentialists in animal ethics lining up with holist environmental ethicists, and you've got the animal rights theorists who are saying we shouldn't kill people, you know, we shouldn't take the lives of individual deer, uh, and so we don't support therapeutic hunting. So that's a case of a, of a divergence that doesn't fit the pattern uh, with respect to the initial divide. And I want to say that I think this is actually a much bigger issue than just something like therapeutic hunting. And I, one of the issues that I've been working on is feral cats, which is a hugely controversial topic. My recommendation is never work on cats. <laughs> because, you get, I mean, I guess there are things for which you could get more hate mail, but cats are not, not, not great for hate mail. Anyway, and so in Australia, uh, there are lots of issues with feral cats, and I put this up because it's one of those things you kind of read it <coughs> on the site, this is one of the, the government sites, patients like, really? Uh, they're developing various poisons for cats, feral cats. Uh, so a ratty cat is the, this is a ratty cat. It's a chipolata sized bait that you put out. Cats are pretty difficult, they're not great on bait, they don't like them very much, so but this is apparently very successful. And now I had to put this up because I thought this was well, funny, it's not really the word, but the idea that, um, that we developed this new bait called Curiosity Right, because it killed the cat. Um, so, so this is now the new bait that's being used. So why are, they, why are cats being killed in Australia? Because they eat a lot of native animals, or so it's alleged. Um, so there are 6.3, varies depending on the time of year, depending on whether it's a drought or not, but up to six to seven million feral cats in Australia. And those cats are uh, killing large numbers of native animals. So this is a, a, a female, the feral cat that was killed, uh, and they took the, what was in its stomach out of its stomach. I didn't show you the photograph of the, the contents of the stomach, I thought that'd be the diagrammatic representation of this uh, so, uh, so the argument is they eat a lot of animals, and in particular, they're threatening a number of indigenous species in Australia, uh, bilbies and bandicoots and various other species. Uh, and because those species are important in Australian ecosystems, the argument is that uh, they're also setting back Australian ecosystems, so they're flourishing as well because cats are in there eating all these things, and so we need, they need to get rid of the cats. And the most common bait that's used on cats in Australia is something called 1080, which is um, actually derived from native plants, uh, at least that it's a chemical that's found in native plants in Western Australia. So a lot of uh, native animals in Western Australia are immune to 1080, or you have, they have to take huge amounts of it before it harms them, whereas it kills cats and foxes and things really quickly. However, research on 1080 suggests it's not very humane, that cats take a long time to die after they've eaten it, uh, and so it can cause very significant suffering for about 12 hours uh, before the cats die. So you might think, well, this sounds like a kind of classic rift case, right? You've got you know, these suffering cats on the one side, and on the other side you've got uh, species being protected, e ecosystem flourishing being protected, so, uh, so it's a rift. What's interesting about this case is that it's trying to be solved by various groups in Australia who are trying to promote uh, cats poisoning of cats as being a case where even if you're concerned about animal welfare, you should side with the poisoning of cats. So this looks like a case where you have, it's rather similar to the therapeutic hunting case, except this time the concern is about it's not so much the cat population that you're worried about, but it's about the native animals uh, versus the cats. So the thought is, in the case just about animal welfare, the use of less than humane techniques, so the use of 1080, may result in an overall reduction of animal suffering, benefiting more native animals than it harms and produced animals. Right? So because the cats are eating like 30 native animals a night, uh, and there's only one cat, uh, and they do this every night, if you get rid of the cats, uh, there's a possibility that you're uh, actually reducing aggregate animal suffering, improving aggregate animal welfare, because if what you're concerned about is animal welfare, 
There, you're not going to make a distinction between whether the animals are native or feral. You're just looking at the sum of welfare. And it looks as if taking cats out of the system uh, is going to be a way of doing that. So their argument is uh, appealing to people who are essentially uh, sentient as consequentialists and saying, well, what you're concerned about is the best consequences in terms of animal welfare. You also need to get rid of the cats. You also ought to think of poisoning them, even if it's in a less than humane way, uh, is better than not using it. Uh, and it does seem as if you take that view, if you don't agree, it's going to be an empirical disagreement. You're going to have to do some to say, well, actually, they're wrong about the suffering here. Actually, the cat's suffering is greater. So, uh, so that, I think, is very interesting. And it leads to this kind of situation where you may have this divergence again between sentient as consequentialists and animal rights theorists. So the animal rights theorists are not going to think that poisoning cats is, is admissible. Uh, and the sentient as consequentialists are going to converge with the holistic environmental ethicists in supporting, potentially supporting less than humane culls of sentient animals, where the reason for the cull is protecting other native animals. But something to note here, so if to say any of this, I'm not saying anything new, right? I think this is a view that, that probably everyone here already knows. <coughs> In this particular case, the kind of the environmental ethicists are all lined up together. Uh, even, the, even if they were biocentrists in this equation, I think they'd be lined up too, because you've got more individual lives at stake as well. Uh, so I think that you've got essentially a view where uh, you're protecting ecosystems, you're protecting species by getting rid of cats. Uh, and in addition, the argument might be you're also protecting wildlife. Now, Ned has lots more to say about this. I think he would agree in this case that, that basically if you have introduce cats in a system, uh, they, these are descendants of people's domestic pets, right? Uh, that they are a kind of a force of human influence on a large scale on a, on a native ecosystem. If you take the cats out of the system, then that's a way of kind of rewilding. Um, and so you might think you're also protecting wildness by this policy. So, in a sense, you've got all the environmental ethicists and the sentences consequentially slide up on one side, with the uh, animal rights theorists on the other. So what I'm going to go on and do is I'll talk about how you, you, these, all these positions get unraveled from being together in the context of climate change. But, but I just want to, this is my next slide. Yeah, so I know some people are going to really, really hate me doing this. And I'm not sure I don't hate it myself. <laughs> but I'm doing this just so that, because at the end, I'm going to put on a, a bigger chart like this. But, and the only, I'm not, and this is all much makes everything massively oversimplified. But the reason I'm doing it is just to show you how you get convergence and divergence where you might not expect it. So in this policy, right, you've got uh, divergence with the animal rights theorists. They're disagreeing, thinking that you shouldn't do something. But all the other kinds of views are lined up. So yes, it looks like this is this is the kind of the, the policy you should pursue. All right. So uh, so I apologise for this, and I'm going to keep apologising. Okay. Okay. All right. So now finally onto climate change. So I told you I need to. Steps back. Um, so this is essentially what I'm going to argue. When you have climate change, you get disruption not only on the animal ethics side, you've got a uh, disagreement between environmental ethicists and then perhaps surprising convergences. And I spent some time speculating with myself, um, if one could do that, about why there might be convergences. So I'm interested to see what you think about that. So I'm going to focus on my friend of Pike, so I've written about the pike of the fall, though not in this context. And it's not just because he's cute, right? but it, there is, you know, there are endless opportunities for cute pictures. More cute than feral cats if their stomachs cut in the middle. So, uh, so the pika uh, is a, a little lagomorph, it's in the rab rabbit family. It lives on the top of mountains in, um, in West, not, not always on the top, but mostly high up in, in mountains in the western United States. Uh, and the, it's listed, it's still listed as being not, not a pike concern, but it's very, very sensitive to heat. So if you heat piker up, obviously I have a habit of doing this, you know, I just heat them up. If you heat piker up to over 76 Fahrenheit, uh, they, they die of heat exhaustion, you know, very, very quickly. They're, not very, they're very, very sensitive to heat. So the worry is, as the mountains are warming in North America, the pike are being driven out of where they've been living until now, some of them are going higher up the mountains, and some lower level communities of pikers seem to be becoming extirpated 
uh, because it's too warm for them and maybe too dry for them as well. But most of this is too warm. Uh, so they can't move around very easily, they can't come down mountains to disperse further north because it's too hot. So they're kind of confined where they are and they're worried, worried that they're going to become extinct. And they've repeatedly been put forward for this thing under the Endangered Species Act. Uh, one of the interesting things about this is lots of them already live in areas that are protected. So you know, setting aside a reserve is not going to protect them. The problem is sort of coming to the habitat that they already have. Uh, and protecting the habitat where we take them. So there are species that are in danger specifically because of climate change. So what can you do about that? There's a bunch of possible conservation strategies that have, are being discussed. So all of these have been discussed. Uh, so I'm not proposing anything surprising here. The first two I put in black because I think they're basically not very helpful for thinking about the problem of climate, right? We can reduce greenhouse gas emissions, of course, that's the long-term solution to this problem. Uh, but, you know, pike policy is not going to drive that problem. Uh, and their position is such that, you know, within the next 20 years, they're in real hazard. Uh, so greenhouse gas emissions are so uh, backlogged, backlog, but, you know, that's not really going to help them. So from the point of view of pike, this is not a policy that's really helpful. Uh, and the traditional, this is what Rob Sandler calls reserve and restoration strategy, where you set land aside, or you reintroduce animals to areas where they, from which they've been extirpated, won't help because they're still too hot, right? So that policy is not going to work for pike. So I'm going to take those two off the table and look at these three policies, right? Think about how they relate to the kinds of values that we're talking about here. So first of all, do nothing. This is obviously not a species conservation strategy in this case, but there might be reasons for thinking that it's the best strategy uh, depending on what your value position is. So there's a do-nothing policy, uh, just let the pipe go, as it were. A second policy that I've been working on next week in Montana, um, we're meeting with a bunch of uh, conservation biologists who are talking about uh, high mountain species, in particular, so snowshoe hare, alpine mice, pica, uh, and what the options are in terms of thinking about genetically modifying these animals in one way or another, hybridizing, populations, so there are some pike populations living at lower levels, a few in warmer places, they seem to have some genetic adaptation, might make it possible to move some of those pike up, up to high altitudes and hybridize them so that those pike may become more resilient to heat. So the basic idea is thinking about how you can adapt them, uh, and there's a lot of discussion about these issues uh, amongst people who work for Revive and Restore, I don't know if any of you have heard of that. Revive and Restore is an organization that does a lot of work on de-extinction projects, but they're also very interested in what they call genetic rescue. So this would be essentially a kind of genetic rescue project. Uh, so that's a possibility, probably, although it's a little bit further away than this one. So assisted migration, as I'm sure most of you know, uh, is essentially moving a species further north in order to uh, put it somewhere cooler. Uh, and there is a lot of discussion about that with Pika. Scientific papers have been written about it. The most interesting one is this one by Wilkin and Cochrane, what journal that was in, where they discuss well, what's the feasibility of doing this? What do we have to do with Pika to, to move them north? Could we translocate colonies of Pika successfully? And they conclude, yeah, you know, this is a they're a good candidate species for for assisted migration. Okay, so so those are the three strategies. I want to look at. So I'm sorry, here it is again. It's only comes one more time, right? So essentially, I've got the values, the different kinds of values I'm interested in down the side, and across the top, I've got the different policies, right? So we talked about this one. So that's the same one we already had. I've put this in because this is such a common kind of conservation strategy. And what's interesting about that is really, pretty much everyone agrees. If you can set aside a reserve and achieve, you know, do you can achieve all kinds of value protection. You can protect ecosystems, you can protect species, uh, you can protect animal rights, at least in as much as you've got hands off, right? You're not infringing on rights. And you can protect wildness. But I put that one in brackets because I know that there are some people here who might want to argue that if you set aside a reserve, you've still got lots of wild animal suffering, you might want to intervene in. Uh, so I put that in brackets because not everyone who takes this view is going to agree that reserves give you the outcome you want. Uh, but mostly that's a kind of wide degree policy. So what I want to do now, this is a slightly more kind of convoluted bit of the talk, is 
to fill in the rest of these boxes, right? And that, I think, will help us to see how there's so much divergence and unexpected convergence between different views when we start thinking about climate change. So I hope this is clear. This is the bit, I rewrote these slides about 100 times. So anyway, this is the best I can do in terms of trying to make this clear. And I had loads more slides that was taking forever, and I pulled out bits of my hair. Um, so this is my best go at it. So the do-nothing policy, right? Supposing we don't do anything with, with climate, we just let them be. What does, that, has, what does that mean for different kinds of value positions? So supposing you're someone who's worried about species protection, right? That's your primary concern, and there are lots of people, lots of the people I work with in biological conservation, that's their main concern, right? They want to protect species and biodiversity. Um, and so doing nothing for them is really not the policy they're keen on, right? They want to do something because they know that if they do nothing, pika are going to become extinct. So they are in favor of acting, and they would be generally opposed to this policy. Uh, suppose that you're concerned about ecosystems, that ecosystem flourishing or ecosystem health or some other view is, is, is what you think is important. Here I'm, I wasn't really sure what to say about this, except that it seems to me at least plausible, and I changed my view on this, to say that if you think that there's a for the sake of ecosystems, so you think that ecosystems uh, could have some kind of intrinsic value or moral considerability, then it seems as if climate change making species extinct or extirpating them anyway in particular ecosystems could be seen as some kind of wrong to the system. Um, now I'm, I'm, I'm open to be argued with on this because I, I, and I've expressed different views in other places. So, uh, but I, I think if you took that view, this is at least plausible. Uh, so then you might think, you know, ecosystems, you might think, well, Pi could play this role in ecosystems, right? They, 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 they go out and they do hay, you know, they gather these bundles of hay, they put them under rocks, uh, those bundles of hay then attract lots of insects and things that live in it, so they create kind of little ecosystems uh, where they live, uh, and they, they produce scat, there's not very many other things, you know, cracking up on mountain tops, so it provides fertilizer and things, so they have a role in the ecosystem, it seems important. So it seems like, well, you know, maybe do nothing isn't great if you're in favor of if you want to protect ecosystem flourishing. So you're likely, I think, to want to do something, but you don't want to do something that's going to make things worse with respect to the ecosystem. So that might be the kind of hesitation. And I think that at least one of the policies might, you might think makes things worse. So that's why I put that there. So here you might think, do something only if this doesn't compound the wrong. OK, suppose you're worried about wildness. Now, I, I, Ned and I, I don't know whether we're going to agree about this, but. Uh, I think that climate change um, is going to, could reasonably be seen as a reduction of wildness. It's an extension of human influence over, the, in a global way, over particular ecosystems. Um, I'm not, I wouldn't think, it's not the end of nature or kind of McKibben-like excessive sort of language, but it does seem to me that we can think of climate change as some kind of reduction of wildness. But it's not something that we intend, it's not something that we control, um, and uh, it's not something that we plan for particular outcomes. So I think that doing nothing may best preserve wildness if by doing something we're actually intensifying human uh, control of ecosystems and human influence over ecosystems. Um, so, of course, wildness is a difficult term and you can attempt it quite different ways as I thought as well. So uh, maybe not in all senses of wildness, but at least in some. Finally, in terms of animal welfare and animal rights, should we do nothing? Certainly it looks as if climate change will make things worse for individual pika. Uh, they will be they will suffer more and their lives will be shortened. Um, there are different ways of construing that in welfare terms. But you know if we can do something uh, if you're uh, someone who wants to improve animal animal welfare, it seems as if you might think we should do something in this case, right? So, on the whole, I think that the sentient consequentialists will generally be in favor of doing something, uh, as long as it's going to improve animal welfare. A rights theorists may think, if they parallel over from climate change's effect on people to 
climate change's effect on animals might argue that climate change violates animals' rights. It's at least a plausible kind of argument. Uh, or certainly that it harms them. And so they may think, well, we should do something about that. But they will not want to do something that is going to further violate animals' rights. So I think in that case, uh, rights theorists are going to probably ob object to any policy that's going to potentially harm animals. Okay, so that's how I think do nothing uh, might look. Do something facilitated adaptation. I can't bear to keep writing that out. So FA, and I don't mean by FA the obvious interpretation of FA, maybe any British people use FA in that way. So by FA, I mean facilitated adaptation. Okay, so, uh, and, and I want to, I'm going to assume, so this is where I'm one of the places where I'm sure that everyone will attack me, but I'm going to assume that we could do this successfully. So I'm not taking into account the possibility of some kind of disaster from genetic modification. Assuming success, because I'm kind of interested in the principle of this thing. What should we think about this if it could work, right? Um, someone who's interested in protecting species for their own sake is going to think, yeah, well, this is going to, if this can protect species, we should do it. So I think on the whole, and that's a, certainly a response I've encountered amongst uh, people that work with species, that this is a good idea if it's going to work. Um, and if you are interested in ecosystem flourishing, you're also likely to think, well, you know, if this keeps, it keeps pica in the system, doing their pica things, uh, you know, building their hay piles and cracking on the mountain, so we should keep, right? We should keep them there, so probably we should do this. Uh, it will probably be better for the ecosystem. There are some hesitations. You might think, well, the system's changing anyway. Is this just keeping some hangover species while everything else is changing? Um, that might be a, a reason for objecting to it. But on the other hand, it's not like there's some way a system ought to look that the piker would mess up if you kept them there. So I'm not sure that that, that, that is right. I'll be interested in how you think about that. So I think on the whole, you'd get probably some agreement there between species and ecosystem value. In terms of wildness, my guess is that many people who are advocates of, of protecting wildness will think that we should not do this. This is extending human influence into wild ecosystems in a very planned way uh, that's producing something that humans want to produce and they chose to produce. But say if you take a few like Rolstons, that what's vital about ecosystems is the kind of spontaneity and creativity of nature. You're not allowing that kind of ecosystem response to climate change. You're coming in and saying, well, no, it should look like this. The pike should stay here. We should adapt them in certain sorts of ways so we keep them. Uh, so it imposes a kind of plan on the ecosystems. And also, in terms of some views like Robert, say Robert Elliott's view, you know, the pike are there because humans kept them there. Uh, so you might think there's a sort of loss of origin value. So I think. Um, that that's a kind of probably don't don't do this don't do this the adaptation. And for animal welfare, I think you're going to get exactly the same kind of rift that I've talked about uh, with the other cases, the feral cats and so on. That doing this is going to involve some costs to pika now, right? If you're going to have facilitated adaptation, there are different ways of doing it. If you're hybridizing populations, you have to translocate pika. They don't like being moved around very much. They're very sensitive. Probably a few of them will die. They get distressed when they're relocated in new places. Uh, so there are lots of potential harms to pika. Um, if it works, you're going to get a lot more pika. Uh, and they're going to also be a lot happier and a lot healthier because they are resilient to heat in ways that the other pika, unadapted pika, wouldn't be. So over time, you get improvements in aggregate animal welfare. Uh, and in fact, if it were the case that pika would go extinct otherwise, uh, you have a whole kind of stream of animal experience that wouldn't otherwise exist. So I think that, that there would certainly be a favorable response uh, with respect to presenting to consequentialists, but the animal rights theorists are going to say, whoa, you know, you're moving, you're distressing animals, you're potentially killing animals, you're moving them from one place to another, uh, you may have to have a kind of breeding colony, you're treating them as a means to an end, there are all sorts of potential objections to doing this from animal rights theorists. So I think that that on the whole they will be opposed to facilitated adaptation. Last policy, uh, assisted migration, um, so here you're moving Piker from one place to another. If it works, 
again, I think the species enthusiasts are going to say, let's do it. And they're the ones that are really arguing for it. You know, people who want to protect pike as a species. However, if you're worried about ecosystem flourishing, you're going to be worried about moving animals from one system into another where they're not native. And the people who are really objecting uh, to assisted migration are essentially invasion biologists who are very concerned about the effects on ecosystems of non-native species in them. Uh, so I've been attacked by Dan Sindelov, for instance, on this particular issue. Um, you know, that, and there's a potential of it compounding wrong. But you can see that if you're moving pike out of a system, it's not benefiting the system that you're taking it out of when you're moving them. And then you're moving them into a system where they're not native. And if it, even if it's successful, then you have worries about how they fit in the system, about potential invasiveness, and so on. So you can see from an ecosystem perspective, probably not a good idea to do this. Uh, is what I think most, most people who are worried about ecosystem values would say. In terms of wildness, very much like the other case. That you're moving something, you're putting something in a system that wouldn't otherwise be there. But I think that there's also, you might also think, well, not only wouldn't Piper be there in terms of origin, uh, but there's compositional wildness, you know, the ecosystem would have had those things in it. Now when we look at what's in the system, we've got something that humans added. So not only are they of origin, of human origin, but they also give you a kind of species set in your system that wouldn't, wouldn't look like that if humans had not intervened. So I think there's a loss of wildness in different senses there. And finally, I think because you're moving them, and because moving distress them, uh, you know, you're going to get agreement by from sentientist consequentialists, and disagreement with animal rights theorists um, for exactly the same kinds of reasons. So in terms of my, here we go, the final manifestation of this hateful thing, um, if you look at it like this, you can see that the ways that different values line up is not really, doesn't look much like an animal ethics, environmental ethics rift. We've got a completely different kind of bundles of values that seem to be lined up against one another. Uh, so you've got, uh, so in the case of the we're kind of doing nothing. Uh, you've got uh, species protection, incentives, consequences, and mining up together. And in fact, they do that all the way along. Uh, you have that conjunction with uh, animal rights theorists often lining up with wildness protection on the kind of do nothing side. Uh, and then e this ecosystem protection could go either way, depending on what the exact case is going to look like. Uh, so, this is a very different kind of way of thinking about what values might look like and what kinds of rifts you might have. Um, and so what I, what I think that this shows is that in the context of climate change at least, you've got divides between environmental ethicists. It's not always the case that people who are concerned about species and ecosystems are going to end up in the same place. And it's certainly not the case that people who are concerned about wildness are going to end up in the same place. Uh, and I think we've got policy divides between animal ethicists, the same one, I mean there are probably lots of others as well, but those are the ones that, you know, that seem to stand out, where aggregate, environment, uh, aggregate welfare improvements for animals may only come at the expense of harms or rights to some other animals. Uh, and then you get this kind of line-up where you've got, essentially, so I've been thinking, you know, what is, is there any kind of underlying pattern here? And well, one of them is that, it looks as if sentience is consequentialists who are concerned about an aggregate animal welfare tend in these cases to line up with kind of interventionist policies that aim to reduce that. And so too do people who want to protect species who are interested in intervening to get these kinds of end goals of species protection and aggregate animal welfare. Whereas animal rights theorists in particularly seem to be lined up with um, those who are concerned about wildness and these hands-off policies. Uh, where you, know, you kind of let things do their own thing, as it were, uh, and you don't intervene. And sometimes you know, those who are concerned about the systems are there too. So that's kind of what this slides up, seems to me to line up looking like, which is very different from the, the idea of there being an animal liberation environmental ethics rift. Now, of course, I thought, you know, I had about six slides of caveats, and no, that's ridiculous. So I only reduced it to one, right? So uh, obviously this is oversimplified. Uh, there are lots of other kinds of divergences I haven't talked about. I think wildness has lots of different meanings. Animal well, I had a whole load of stuff on different interpretations of animal welfare and how this played out, but I had to do it time to talk about it. So there's lots of different meanings there. And of course there are all these different 
recent interpretations of animal rights. Uh, so I know that Donaldson and Kimlick are more kind of interventionists in what they call overspill cases, for instance. So they may be more interested, but I don't think they would violate, want to violate animals' rights in order to, uh, to, to do some of these policies. Um, and then there could be cases where you've got a different line up. But I don't think that that undermines what I'm trying to say. I just think that uh, there is a much more fragmented value view out there than a kind of an animal rights environment ethics sort of divide. But I've seen this, I've already said that. And the thing, the thing I also haven't done is say, well, which of these values should be prioritised, which is what the original paper is going to be about. So I said I would step back and I really did, right? So I haven't said anything on that. So my final slide is. So we were asked this question with this versus here. I hope we tried to put in red. And I, my conclusion is I'm not sure that this versus really exists uh, in lots of... So there are cases, I think, where you do find it. So I'm not saying there are no cases like that. Um, but in conservation policy under climate change, the things do seem to me to be much more fragmented. There are much more, many more other, other kinds of thought lines. Uh, and so where you have this kind of pervasive impact of climate change, then I think that uh, that sort of breaks down old alliances, but also creates potential new possibilities uh, for conservation policy convergences. So I'm going to stop there. I have no idea where I'm, how I'm doing for time, but yeah, that's me done. Okay, thanks for the talk. Um, so let me make a list. I take hands and also fingers. That's Christine. Um, Christine, because it's dark. No, I don't know. Then, then it must have been Angie. <laughs> okay, um, thanks for the talk. Um, so I guess I go, and I think that you were kind of aware of it in the slide with the caveat, but I guess I go wondered, it seemed to me that you were over egging <laughs> the divergence between uh, sentientist oh, consequentialists okay. and animal rights theorists. So I guess like in the case of therapeutic hunting and the feral cats, it seems like there the assumption is the only thing that we can do is adopt these less than humane policies. But okay, I think yeah, that so both of them would be agreed that like what we should be doing is employing humane policies which control populations and not you know, in ways that don't have to kind of kill the population. Right, okay, no, so that's a good point. So I'm doing some work and uh, you know, Josh is a we do some work on contraception in wild animals, right? And I'm working on a deer contraception. But actually, you know, lots of these policies, in fact, generate a whole load of other issues about harm to animals. Uh, so they may seem to be, so contraception policies do raise lots of problems in deer, which is the case I know about. Uh, so while you can, you can think of, you know, it's, not, it's not clear to me that you're, you don't raise other kinds of issues. But still, it's also true in the case of cats, you know, that it might well be the case that killing cats just means that like more cats come in. And so you're not really solving the problem by killing cats. Uh, and so there's this big battle about, well, does trap neuter use, trap use return? You know, is that going to solve the problem where you have neuter populations? And so, so yeah, and I think it's only the case if you've got, you have to, it has to be, for, I mean, a consequential is going to have to say, well, and this is the only available policy that's going to achieve, you know, it's got to be the best policy that's going to achieve the end. Uh, so you're right. So maybe that divide is too sharp because you know, there are always going to be alternatives. And I think that's probably also true in the cases of facility in migration ah. and facility adaptation. I think that there's an animal rights case that can be made for those things. Even, even, though, you, even you, though you risk hurt harming individual animals. Right, that's and that's because the part of an ongoing community over time, you might think, right? So at some point, they're going to be killed by the effects of anthropogenic climate change. Climate change. So it might be that you can justify violating the rights of some in order to... So a kind of, uh, sort of a mini ride or whatever it is, principle, whatever Regan calls it, someone help me, I think it's mini ride, where you try and minimize Minimize it. So if some rights are going to be violated, violated, but you're going to try and minimize the number of rights that are violated. So if climate change is going to violate all climate rights, then you can step in and violate some yeah. in order to Poss yeah, I'm possibly. I mean, there is an issue. The other issue, which I thought someone might maybe one of the hands or fingers was about this, is that you might say, well, the way in which climate change affects things is not rights violating in the same way that if I go in and kill a pike, it's rights violating. I think there's another there's a, there's another question to be had there about responsibility for climate change. So yeah, 
Um, and so that might, that might kind of undermine that argument a bit. Um, but yes, I think these are good points. Yeah, so thank you. Can I have the hands in this corner here again? That was, okay, then you go. Uh, thanks, Josh Norbert. Um, so I really enjoyed that, thank you. I agree with some of what Angie said. Um, and I think I think there could be an animal rights case for more uh, facilitated adaptation. Yeah, that's this is great. So I like that. So, um, so the, the, over, the minimise overriding harm might be one way to go. But another way to go is an interesting methodological point that you said. I'm assuming that all of this works fine, and then the main animal rights objection seems to be there might be deaths and suffering on the way. Well, I think that's inevitable, though. That's if inevitable. it works fine, you can't avoid it. Oh, okay, okay. I mean, certainly, for instance, if you're if you're doing facilitated adaptation. The most plausible way of doing it is to have a colony where you take some out and you have to, then you have to you know, basically use IVF and all this kind of stuff on them uh, in order to, to, to get your genes into the population. So some of them are going to have a really decent time. Huh, decent. Yeah, so, yeah. Okay, that's interesting. So, I mean, um, we, we could, we could but there are some, But there probably are yeah. ways, you know, there are probably some cases where you could do that and you may, it may be easier to do it with um, assisted migration, maybe less bad, right, where you're just yeah. moving. Things. But because I, I did some research on, in a previous case um, on moving white bark pines, and white bark pines have these birds that are associated with them. And you have to move the birds if you're going to move the pines, and the birds do very badly when they're moved, um, and they, they don't they have all kinds of struggles because they're sort of they're what's the word hefted? That's what we say, right? Hefted onto their, their territory, and if you move them, that's really problematic for the first generation. Um, so there, so I do think that it would be hard to avoid. However well you did it, you couldn't really avoid some animal suffering and potentially some animal death along the way. Could I also just ask yeah. quickly about, you had the kind of five different positions. I wonder yeah. where you put your own relationship-based approach. Yeah, I left myself out. I was yeah. thinking that was the best. Okay, so you, you do see yourself as a completely separate position. No, I think that, um, I mean, my position would justify, justify some kind of, inter would say that climate change is a case where uh, you would, Yes, there's some justification in assisting animals that are negatively affected by climate change. And I think that in these cases, I would make the argument that, uh, that I mean, I, I wasn't making a right to you. I think there are times when it's justifiable to harm animals for some, some greater benefits. And I think that this, for these cases, might be cases like that. So I am actually, generally speaking, in favor of them if I, if I think they're going to succeed. Um, because also, I think that protecting species is not that I think there's necessarily a fall. I didn't say I'm not very skeptical about these arguments, right? That there is a fall in saving species and ecosystems. I just assumed it, but I am fairly skeptical about it. But still, I think that, they, that we value them. They're intrinsically valuable in the sense that we value them, you know, for, for us. And so, in that case, I think that's another reason for doing for doing those things. It's good that they're applied there. Thanks. Um, was that a follow-up by you, or? Was that no, 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 no. Okay, then I'll put you on the list. Yeah. And um, next one would be um, you, please. <coughs> Great, okay. Um, so, so I guess I also have a similar kind of question, right. which is um, are the, the sentience as consequentialist and the rights theorist as far apart as, as you suggested? And, and I, I want to flag agreement with some of the reasons why people have suggested that rights theorists might be a little bit more accommodating of intervention than you suggested, although you acknowledge that to the end of your talk. Um, but, but I wanted to focus on the sentience as consequential mm -hmm. side. So, um, you know, one frustrating and wonderful thing about sentience as consequentialism is you can make it into whatever you want it to be by uh, filling with the facts. Um, so one, one thing that uh, sentience as consequentialists do, which I think is absolutely right, is to talk about how if we really want to push towards a world that has animal liberation, um, we, we need to treat animals with respect and we need to treat animals with dignity. We need to treat them as having rights and then um, uh, take very seriously the project of respecting those rights as part of a general practice that will persuade people to treat animals well on welfare terms. Mm -hmm. um, so given that, I wonder if uh, an optimal interpretation of a sort of indirect, sophisticated kind of sentience as consequentialism might take more seriously than you suggested in your talk the need to treat animals as having inviolable rights in certain kinds of situations, rather than just to um, do whatever we need to do uh, in order to um, efficiently maximize animal welfare in the short term. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think that 
and, and then that would push them a little bit more towards um, the middle ground that other people were pushing the right stairs towards. So you're suggesting a kind of Use use of rights theory for essentially consequentialist purposes. Yes. But consequentialism is about how it appears to people rather than actually what the outcomes are. Yeah, the it, 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 instead of treating animals as right. means to an end, you treat rights talk right. <laughs> as so, a means to an end. Yeah, so but would I mean then that would suggest that you were reacting more strongly against things like that I'm talking about, right? It's because you're going to say, well these are violating you know, assisted migration violates animals' rights, so we shouldn't do it. Maybe it would probably depend on the case, but that's the suggestion. Okay. Well, yeah. So then, yeah. Then, yeah. Okay. That. I mean, that's. I suppose that's possible. Uh, I mean, I guess that someone like Gary Varner is not going to. You know, I mean, he. You know, he's down the line. Sentence. Sentence is consequentialist, and he would think that that was not really bringing about the best consequence. I don't think that would fall into his category of uh, sort of working principles. Um, so, but I mean, some some of them. So there's a debate to be had about what's going to bring about the best consequences, right. I guess. Yeah. Um, so is the argument? The argument might be, well, okay, if we think that animals have more viable rights, overall, that's going to be better for animals. For instance, in agriculture, right? So uh, because if because people will look and think, how can these same people want to oppose animal suffering in agriculture, while at the same time uh, they're happy to impose suffering on pika in order to keep pika in another place? So how can that be consistent? So best to be consistently opposed to both of them because that's going to improve animals. That's interesting. I don't know. Maybe you're right. Uh, I guess it's an empirical question what we actually bring about best consequences. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, I'll think about that. Thank you. That's interesting. Was that a finger, a follow-up, or? No. Okay, then I'll put you on the list, and the next one would be um, to the question. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, so I guess um, I'm going to ask about rights theory, too. Um, sorry. Um, That's all right. But I'm going to put the point slightly differently. Um, so I guess I would have thought the best answer a rights theorist would give to the adaptation and uh, migration would be something like, meh, okay. Meh, it's okay. There's something problematic about it. It involves, you know, forced in vitro fertilization and, and rights violations. but. And I'm not sure how to put this in terms of, like, of say, Regan's rights theory. Yeah, I can't see Regan accepting it. But it seems... But some rights theories might be. Yeah, so yeah, so, right, so it seems like any plausible rights theory is going to have a catastrophe clause, where you're justified in violating rights in the case, in the case of catastrophe. So, like, if the human race was at stake, right, the future of the human race would say you could torture somebody. <laughs> To uh, you know, figure out how to defuse the bombs. It and it seems like that's the sort of case that the Pika are facing with respect to climate change and extinction. Well, okay, from the so standpoint I, of the I, of the of the Pika. But but from the standpoint of well, but from the standpoint of Pika, there isn't Pika. I mean, you're you're kind of, to do that. You have to make species a thing, right? And that's something that I don't think, say, Regan would be interested in doing. Mm -hmm. There are all these individuals that have rights. Mm -hmm. There isn't something called Pika. But, I mean, he was the very person that argued that we shouldn't right. be, you know, trying to sacrifice individuals for the sake of the species, their species or some other species. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that that argument is going to work without adding on something about species value too. Now I suppose you you know you could say well there and what I didn't talk about was when you could say well there are these animal you know the animals are rights and then have rights and then there are also species values and we need to think about whether you know sometimes these other values are more important than they can justify uh, but I don't think, I, I can't see it kind of coming from the right the right side yeah, theory the prospect of the extinction of species might not activate a catastrophe. No, I mean, one of the issues, that I, one of the concerns that I had that I've talked about with respect to climate change as well, you know, so if you have, I mean, if you lose all the pica and you get an, an equal number of rats, I mean, they all, they're all subjects of a life, you know, they're all, so why would you worry about that if you, from that perspective? And because species variety and biodiversity is not an issue from that view. Um, uh, yes, thank, thank you very much for this talk. 
Uh, I know you made a lot of distinctions, so it may be inappropriate to have uh, another one. But when addressing the facilitated uh, adaptation mm -hmm. policies, uh, you put together agglutination and rain, population reinforcement on one hand, and genetic modification, and especially uh, um, manipulation of the genome by uh, CRISPR and mm -hmm. Cas9 on the other hand. And among some farm uh, conservationists, these two kinds of strategies are really different, and it's even not the same communities that will uh, advocate for uh, each of them. And I was I'm just That's curious yeah. about uh, your point of view, uh, and especially regarding this uh, acceptability from the white value, for instance, Acceptability from the from the white value perspective, right. or whiteness value perspective. Do you see any um, substantive difference in these different strategies, or is it just the same kind of? Interesting. So. Um, I mean, I know that the, what is, so the, the communities that think there's a difference between, so the, the classic kind of genetic rescue case of having, which is hybridization, of moving, so, so a bunch of um, panthers from Texas were moved to Florida to make with some pumas in Florida that were of a related subspecies, uh, but not, they weren't the same subspecies in Florida, uh, but they were moved because they were, there was inbreeding of the Florida population. I don't know if you heard about this case. Uh, and the idea was that you know, there wasn't enough genetic variety. Those, those, um, those pumas have some kink tails and they have poor reproduction. And when the Texas ones were moved in, that really improved the gene pool. Uh, and um, it looks as if that population is now doing much better. Right, so that's the kind of classic hybridization case. And that's, yeah. uh, so there were lots of objections to doing that because people saw it as a kind of intervention, uh, that it was not only bad for the individuals, but there was some, uh, I, take, I, I take it to be a, a kind of a naturalness objection, that there's something wrong with moving animals uh, and kind of deliberately hybridizing them. Now there are also practical objections about what's the effect going to be on breeding, breeding, and how breeding, and moving species together, right? so there's that too. Um, when you're doing something with gene editing, uh, you are doing something different. Um, and so the objections might be something about, well, this is more radical, and the potential consequences are like, you know, with, with much less idea what, com what the consequences might be of doing this and doing hybridization. We can be fairly sure that hybridization is unlikely to be a total disaster, although it could be. You could get out what they call, you know, outbreeding depression from mixing groups. Um, but it could, could go okay. Um, it's more likely to go okay than gene editing, which we don't know what will happen. So I guess that there is one reason for objecting to the gene editing is being less sure about consequences than you might be with hybridization. Another might be, which I have much less, and I have some sympathy for that worry, another objection might be, well, there's, there's less, it's much more unnatural to edit genes than it is to hybridize. And I'm ne never very sympathetic to kind of naturalness objections. Um, so if, if it's not a naturalist objection that's about consequences, <coughs> then I'm not. Then that would not in itself bother me. That something was unnatural. So I would. I would not be worried about it on that basis. Um, and so that's, I guess, a convoluted kind of answer. Um, and so, so where I have heard objections to CRISPR-Cas9 or whatever like that are not objective to hybridization. It's always been, this is much further out and the science is less secure and we're much less sure about what will happen. And that seems reasonable. Um, so that's, I guess, what I would say. But if you had a real worry about wildness or a worry about naturalness in that genetic sense, then it does seem like one is more problematic than the other. But that's not a worry that I have. Uh, Thank you. Uh, my question has been addressed to because, yeah, I was also thinking that probably animal rights theorists could be more, um, uh, could, could permit some form of assisted migration because in the case of humans, we would absolutely help with migration. We would not let these individuals die. So I, I do think that a lot, 
even if you have a, a, a causal lead, like a, a, a conception based on causal relationship, we are responsible for climate yeah. change, so we have these duties. But you, you, uh, you mainly answer, uh, answered this question. I think we'll, uh, Kimlika and Suda Nelson would also say that if we can do that in a way that we will not have to permanently manage the peak yes. population and that yes. peak population will not uh, disrupt too much the local population, it will not be only permissible, but it would be obligatory to, uh, to do that. Yeah. But, uh, so, but I know that you quite answered that question. So my question would be instead, you didn't talk about, I was curious, you didn't talk about the possibility of uh, geoengineering in order to cool down uh, the I had mountain. To stop the mountain. I was like, like, no, I'm not going to add geoengineering into this as well. This is going to be Sorry. Yeah, right. So I mean, I think that just sets off a whole other train of things. So okay. I think that's a really interesting. Yeah, I didn't talk about geoengineering. But again, I don't think, you know, that, say, Piker policy is going to drive geoengineering, right? If geoengineering is going to be done, it's going to be done because you know, humans decide this is going to be better for some of them, or some humans decide this is going to be better for some of them, right? Uh, it's not going to be kind of wildlife policy that drives it. So, uh, and that will have, would have, well, depending on what form of geoengineering, that would have mixed you know, impacts on wildlife. It's true. I wouldn't do much for anything in the sea anyway, certainly not if you're worried about ocean acidification and you're trying to, you know, just block sunlight or something like that. But actually, I wanted to go back to the other the thing you said, first of all, one of the interesting things about assisted migration is that it's likely that if you're going to want to move populations, say with pica, you would need to start moving them pretty soon because you need to have enough genetic mix in your population. And when you move them, you've got, you can have a healthy diversity. If you wait until you've hardly got any left and you start moving them, you've already got inbreeding because you haven't got enough of them. Um, and so actually the pica that you'd need to move probably wouldn't die of climate change. It's for those particular pica, that's not something that's probably in there. So we're not quite there yet. Some populations are low-lying, they may be moving up. You know, some of them may be not able to stay where they were. But there hasn't been a mass die-off um, of pica. And probably a large majority of those that are currently alive won't die because of climate. They, they overheat. But, you know, in 15 years' time they will. But you need to start moving them before that in order that you've got enough diversity. So there's a kind of specific, you still get the aggregate, you'd get the aggregate gains, but those particular ones you move would probably have had better lives, much better lives if they'd stayed where they were. So there is still an issue that for those pica, it's not a choice of either you die from climate change or you get moved to a cooler climate. Right? In which case, if it was, that was the case, then I think that the moving that would be much more justifiable from almost any ethical perspective. So yes, yeah, so I think that's a really interesting question. Yeah, I just have a remark um, concerning the uh, conservationist position. Yeah, so uh, good. I thought you were yeah. talking about that. I think it depends on, of course, a lot of empirical questions. Yes, yes. But I believe that aside, yeah, it might also depend on a more theoretical position. Right, OK. I think you assumed a total utilitarian, yes. which is fair enough right. because Peter Singer is a very yes. best known uh, utilitarian animalist. And you said that suffering for the Presently existing pica may be justified because it allows that there will be pica in the future and so on. Um, so yeah, but perhaps if you uh, take into consideration only the suffering of those who already exist right. or who will yes. exist independently of what we do, then the picture looks different. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. That would be really interesting to think about. So yes, thank you. That's a very helpful point. Um, yeah, uh, well, thank you very much for your challenging talk. Uh, so I have, well, a concern, I have several concerns, but we will <laughs> discuss them. I thought people would have. Yeah, so, so um, yeah, I, regarding the, the attitude of the sentience focus uh, consequentialist concerning, for instance, the case of the cat. Well, first of all, I, I agree with uh, you, I think, yeah, uh, that, uh, I mean, most of, of, most of, of the consequentialists I know would claim that, you know, when we consider yeah, that uh, we can do some good by doing this, but we are going to have a bad effect because this is going to reinforce a uh, species view. On the overall, we, should, we shouldn't do it. Without, I think without necessarily assuming a right discourse, right? You just keep quiet about that because you don't want to reinforce consequences. But anyhow, the main point there, I mean, I was a bit surprised that you came up with, with the argument because this is obviously not, well, sorry for saying obviously. Yeah, this is not a, sorry. 
Yeah, that was hard work. <laughs> it wasn't yeah, hard. That's but, fine. Um, this is not a, an, an, an argument that challenges um, the view that uh, we should respect the lives of, of those guys. It's also an argument against predation as such. So it can be uh, applied in the case of any other predator. And this is clearly, right. this is clearly, right. I mean, the, the, uh, this is one of the, of the more clear cases in which you know the environmentalist and the animal focus or sentience focus uh, uh, approach will, will diverge. Of course, you can appeal to, you know, uh, empirical considerations. Okay, but if we um, eliminate all these predators here, there will be more suffering, more death, uh, whatever. But if we don't, if we totally engineer uh, ecosystems so we get rid of all these predators and have much simpler ecosystems, that would be great. Okay, so this is something I didn't say. Well, I should have said, so this was in my original paper, as ever, when you give a talk and you don't use notes, you miss something out. But I don't think this is a standard case, like just a general, a general case about removing predators from systems, because this is an invasive predator that wasn't otherwise there. So the usual objection, so if someone says to Peter Singer, you know, well, why should, should, doesn't your view imply that we should remove predators from systems? He says, well, we don't know enough about ecosystems, we don't know what will happen if we take them away, you know, there'll be much more suffering generated by doing those kinds of things. That's a, and, you know, and that seems like a perfectly reasonable kind of worry. We don't, don't you know. These systems are set up to have these animals in, but they're not set up to have cats in. So in the case of invasive species, the, eco, the argument that, well, you know, we don't know what will happen in the ecosystem taken away. It doesn't really work because we do know because the ecosystem didn't used to have them in there, right? They were there 20 years ago. So, you know, the, so that, that argument I think doesn't work in these kinds of cases. Although I do think it's a, it's a serious argument in the case of more general arguments about predator removal. Um, so someone, I don't know who Oscar is, but he's giving a pay for this, right? So, you know, the, that's, there is that general question, but in this case I think that, that question could be stopped because cats are not part of that system. But then it's an empirical issue. It is an empirical it, it, it just so happened that we have more knowledge uh, about how fish sure. we grow, but, but the normative case is just the same. Yeah, but then for, for all of these cases, it's going to be for, if you're back to your view, if your view is what's going to bring about the best consequences, you've got to think about the, the empirical issues. But what we do know is that the general empirical stop on doing it, which is these things are meant to be in ecosystems, uh, we don't know what happens if we take them out doesn't work because we do know what happens when we take them out, the system's fine because it was there beforehand without cats in it. So I, that's just, I think, the empirical situation is different in, in the cat case than it is in if you were talking about, say, wolves and cannibals or something. Um, I was wanted to talk about your, uh, ask you about the do nothing language um, because, so it's do nothing and the pica will go extinct. No, do nothing and we're driving them extinct. True. Through climate change. Yeah. We're doing it on it. Yeah, I agree. We're doing it somewhat unintentionally, but. Um, so it's not really do nothing, that's right. So, right, it's, really it's, it's killing them, but yeah. in a not direct in a way. Direct, in direct action, yeah. And, and then, um, so doing nothing would be the best way to preserve wildness. And at least with those, at, at least. Avoiding doing assisted migration and facilitated adaptation. Right? If we if we don't do those, that's the best way to preserve wildness. That's yes, what, and that's why and that's yeah, and that's why if I I actually had in brackets <coughs> because I mean there could be you know some other things that were that you could do that and if so you talk about extracting so you have, my guess is that you you would think taking invasive things out of systems. That's a kind of an intervention, but it's a way of restoring wildness, right? right. So right. there are some things. There are cases like all that. In this case, are, yeah. Okay. So, so if you did like, let's say, let's say this is a ridiculous example, but let's say if you build a little bridge over a river, the, the better adapted pika, you know, the better heat adapted mm -hmm. pika could get across and could get to the others, and that would so the pika would survive in the climate change world. That. That's not do nothing, that's do something, that's do something really little. And that's different than, it's not than assisted migration and the bigger thing where you put them on airplanes and fly them out or whether you take genes and move them around. And, right, so, so in that case, in the little bridge case, then you would increase nationalist by interference. And, and maybe, and I might argue that, you know, because if you, if you don't, if you don't do anything, 
pike and go extinct. Yeah, and and humans are responsible for that. That's a kind of <laughs> impact. That yeah. Now yeah, that no. there are pike in the American West, and we did that. So yeah, and yeah, that's what kind of what you're going, one of the things you're going to talk about in your paper. So, and so I think that that's that's interesting. Working out, you know, what kinds of interventions overall actually increase wildness and diminish wildness in some sense. I mean, I think maybe often there's also different senses of wildness at play that we're not really paying attention to. So there are kind of ways in which we're increasing wildness. As, you know, in, we're increasing. You know, we might increase wildness, compositional wildness, because having pica in the system is a kind, you know, that's part of what makes it wild. But if we put them there, then we're decreasing origin wildness, but we're increasing compositional wildness. So, that, you know, we use wildness in these different ways, but if you break it down a bit, you can come to all sorts of... So I think that, that may be kind of what's going on there, and then you need to think about which sense of wildness you know, really matters here. But yeah, no, I think that's, that's also a great question. Really interesting. So part of Kaka. Oh, uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Claire, for your talk, and especially for not quoting me early on. Well, uh, you don't like <laughs> I deliberately didn't quote trying to refer because I know you don't like it, so I just left it out. So, uh, one of the uh, projects that uh, I've been lately uh, pursuing is uh, how does philosophy as discipline um, rescue itself in the uh, 21st century uh, when the discipline uh, in the 20th century have become so narrowly focused that we're not really interacting uh, with larger uh, intellectual communities. And I thought that your paper was, or your presentation here was a great example of how philosophers can add value to uh, policy uh, developments that are policy issues that are, are really debated in other communities. But that also then, then obliges us to uh, familiarize ourselves with the conversations that are going on, uh, for example, in ecology. And so it was gratifying to me that you mentioned uh, that you've been criticized by... Um, uh, uh, oh, yeah. Uh, Simbolov. Uh, Dan Simbolov. Um, but he's rather extreme sure. uh, in, in being conservative where ecosystems are concerned. And, yeah. And, uh, on the other hand, you have people like uh, Richard Hobbs who are are embracing novel ecosystems and even designer yep. uh, ecosystems in the name no, of ecological good. restoration. So it's important to realize, all, all I'm saying, is that we can't just assume that certain disciplines like ecology are sort of have a consensus about, about them uh, no. and that their disputes are as... Uh, vigorous as, as, as our own. Yeah, so, I mean, there's it's, it's a risk. And so then that's true amongst the conservation biologists that I'm going to be working with next week. There are a, real, a, real, a really big range of views on what they think, partly because of wildness concerns, right. and partly because of, I guess, ecosystem concerns. They all want to protect species, but they're, you know, they're kind of worried about different sorts of how far you can go with these kinds of things. Um, so that's why they want to meet to talk about ecosystems about it. So because they're actually in practice out there on the mountains. So, so some of them are working with um, with fish, where the water is becoming too warm for the fish in Mountain Montana and the streams. And some of them, they've already been moving fish from one from streams into a, into a, a big kind of lake, which is cooler. Uh, but that's created the kind of issues both amongst people, local people who don't think the fish should be moved, and so you know they so. You, these really kind of practical policy things raise these bigger issues and divergence amongst the ecologists. So there's just divergence everywhere. I think that's really what I'm trying to say. <laughs> right? There isn't a lot of convergence, and where there's convergence is where you would expect it to be, and not necessary for any obvious underlying reason. Yeah. So I just wanted to give you the opportunity. Yeah, thank you. That's, that's elaborate a little bit. Yeah, that's that. great. Thank you. I was just wondering if um, the culpability of the human agents makes a difference because responsibility for climate change is very differentially yeah. distributed both, both yeah. in, in between countries but between individuals. Yeah. And I know people who are, for all practical purposes, professional travelers, right, who go from one reasonably exotic or allegedly exotic place after another. Uh, that seems to be their life. They must have 50, 100,000 miles of air run a year. Do they have any special responsibility for dealing with these issues? Yeah, I mean. And how would it matter? That's another. That's another great question. I mean, whether climate, what you think about 
who's responsible, who should, who, to whom, you know, if you're going to say, so that comes up with the kind of the idea that, you know, does climate change violate rights? And this is just as much, I mean, I don't think animals pose any special issue here. This is the same issue that you have with human beings, you know, I mean, does climate change violate animals' rights? Does it violate humans' rights? Well, you know, there, there are, there's a big debate about that. Um, and if so, who is particularly responsible? Should the target focus go through the particular wealthy nations, but then what about uh, the poorer people in those nations or the people who choose not to produce many emissions? Why should they be responsible for things just because they live in a place? So yeah, I mean, that was too big an issue to, to try to resolve. Um, and that's kind of why I didn't spend too much time thinking about climate change as a wrong in itself. Um, so I guess that's another whole set of things. But I don't think that the, the animals and the environment pose a special question with respect to that. I think that's a general question that applies to people as well. So it may not be a very adequate answer, but that's a piece of work to do with that one. Now I have two more questions. Sophia, it's nice. Uh, thanks a lot for your talk. Um, I was wondering about the uh, assisted uh, migration. And, um, uh, so I have two points. Um, the first one is uh, uh, I, I think that uh, maybe uh, even if you want to protect species, uh, you might uh, be against the assisted migration if the species is going to be in a, another ecological niche. I mean, uh, because depending on your uh, definition of what is the species, uh, it's a like when you will uh, migrate your population to up to north, maybe you won't actually keep uh, the, the same species uh, uh, not alive, but you know, like, uh, so you won't be the same species up north. Okay, so, all right, so there's a worry about moving a species. So you're not saying you keep the species but you lose the value, which is one point you might make. If you think species matter in place and you move them, you lose the value. But you're saying you actually might not have the same species if you Yeah, I mean, eventually it will evolve, but it's, that's true. Yeah, but... That's what you mean. Yeah, but... Uh, I don't know if, uh, if, you, if, you, if you change the population from its uh, actual ecological niche, maybe you won't have... Uh, yeah, I'm not sure, like, it's a... It's a like, the species we had before what, uh, is going to be the one which is going to okay. evolve in the future. And, uh, so I guess uh, we need a philosopher of biology to tell us about how we define species, right? So that would be better. Yeah. And I did actually think about sex thing like that. So yeah, that's an interesting point. And maybe my second point was a way to um, to reconciliate the, the two uh, to approach like the species one in the ecosystem one. Mm -hmm. Because if you, uh, if uh, I know that we don't know uh, many things about how uh, ecosystem work and what the, uh, the role or the function of species in the ecosystems, but if you uh, try to know um, uh, what is the, the ecological role of uh, of the uh, of the pica and. Uh, what, for example, uh, is the uh, 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 relationship with the other species uh, uh, will uh, uh, influence, for example, the density of the population of pika in the areas, actual ecosystems, and uh, what uh, what we could expect if we put the pika in another ecosystem uh, with some other kind of uh, relationship mm -hmm. between species. I mean. I, I think that, uh, and, and that if, if we can have enough knowledge to know what's going to, to, to happen, uh, maybe we can choose like, the right ecosystem to, 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 to save uh, both the pika, uh, I mean, to save the, the pika species without uh, uh, destroying uh, another yeah. ecosystem. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right, and that they, I mean, they, it seems at least plausible that there could be cases where you move something and it actually provides ecosystem services in the ecosystem that you move it into, um, even though it wasn't there before. Because if you're very careful about where you put it and you know a lot about the system that you're putting it into, 
So then you will have agreement. It should be the case that you know, someone who values ecosystems and someone who values species agrees that that's a good move. And, and maybe um, uh, this is an idealistic situation, but maybe I, I don't really know if you can really save the species if you move it in an ecosystem where, for example, she's going to be invasive in the ecosystem because in, in the long run, maybe the species couldn't really adapt to this ecosystem, which right. can, uh, where she cannot have like good relationship with other species. So, I mean, I, I guess you you have to look at both sides right. to, to be sure it's going to work. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think and that's. I mean, people who are doing this, that's just what they're trying to do, I think. You know, think about what will happen in the recipient system and what will happen to the species and are there ways we can you know, match that so that you know, this is doing something good or at least not good things for everything around it. So yeah, I mean, that's, that would be an ideal. I mean, you still get wildness objections, I think, but, but you would, you, you should, there, there should at least be some cases where you can bring those together. So I agree. Yeah, thank you. Time is up, but we have one last question. It will be really short and quick. In your abstract, I was reading it yesterday, yeah. I was really interested to know your arguments because you, you were saying that your conclusion would be that animal welfare should be prioritized over species protection, but species protection should be prioritized over uh, protecting the ecosystem and the wildness. So yeah. what, what is your argument? You said that you would argue for yeah, that, but, but I didn't, you didn't that that. So I decided I needed to do some groundwork before I got to that argument. Um, so I have not made that argument. Okay, so and I would still say I was working on it. I mean, I think that I, um, I would still say that, yeah, that animal. Yeah, no, I'm not going to try and argue that. Now. <laughs> <laughs> this only will be short and quick, right? I'm required to give the short and quick answer. I've been here for the rest of the evening. <laughs>